Welcome everyone to our webinar, Design for a Better World, with our esteemed panelists who are going to introduce you to in just a moment. But first I wanna give you a quick introduction to the UX Design Institute, who is the company behind this incredible event. The UX Design Institute is a global leader in UX design education, and our courses are university credit rated and industry expert approved. So that means that you will get deep expertise and a qualification that employers respect and trust. Plus, our mentors and career advisors are always there along the way to support you in your learning journey. Our uh, website link will be in the chat in just a second, so feel free to take that link and explore our website after the webinar. Our um, early bird pricing is actually in effect for the next few days where you'll get up to 30% off our courses, so do check that out. And last thing from me is down the bottom right hand side of your screen, you will see a chat box. That is your space to engage with each other, comment on your perspectives, your opinions and your ideas as you're hearing the conversation. And beside that, you'll see a question box. That is your opportunity to pose some questions to our panelists. We'll be reviewing that during the webinar and we'll pick a few great ones to ask our panelists at the end of the session. With that, that is everything from me, and I'm going to pass it over to Gareth Dunlop, who is going to be our MC for the conversation. So, Gareth, over to you. Great. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, please allow me to add my welcome to yours, to all of you who have joined us uh, from across the world. Uh, and, of course, can I extend a very special welcome to the four panellists whose company I have the pleasure of over the next hour. Our topic for the session today is Design for a Better World, and we're fortunate to be joined by panellists who have been thinking, uh, deliberating, writing, debating, exploring uh, this subject uh, for years, if not decades. The subject of designing a better world is a weighty one, and the pursuit of a better world is an almost universal human desire. So while we won't get all of the answers in the next 60 minutes, I do hope we can explore some of the key themes which have emerged from our panelists' work and consider how they might apply to the personal and professional lives to all of us as designers. It's my great pleasure to introduce the panelists, uh, Don Norman, Irene Au, uh, Brenda Laurel and Aaron Walter. You're very welcome. And I wonder, might I start by asking each of you just to take a minute to um, introduce yourselves uh, and to share with us your relationship uh, to and your interest in the topic that we're exploring today. Dawn, I wonder, could I kick off by asking you uh, just to say a little bit about, about yourself and why this topic's such a relevant and interesting one to you? You have to tell us who goes first and oh, next. Don, oh, yourself, please, Dawn, if I can kick that off to you. So I started off as a nerd, as an electrical engineer, uh, ended up by accident as a psychologist, uh, and then ended up as another accident as a designer, and with it being an industry executive along in the middle. Uh, and I'm, I assume most of the audience knows I've written lots of books on how to make things easier to understand and uh, easier to use. Actually, I developed an online course with Irene, uh, and I uh, have worked with Brenda since well, forever. Um, and I realized that, you know, making things easier to understand was nice, but it doesn't change the world. And I wanted to do something that was important. And when I thought about all the issues facing us in this world, I said, what can I add? Because lots of really good people have approached these issues. But I realized that they're not approaching it correctly because they mostly look at the technology. And most of the books that are coming out telling you, here's the technology that we need to have. They're absolutely right. So how come we don't have it? And I decided the real issue is human behavior and that maybe my background, first of all, as a business executive, I understand what the pressures are in business. And second of all, as a psychologist, so I understand people. And third of all, as a technologist, I understand technology. So I ended up writing this book called Design for a Better World, which you'll hear more about later. Great, Don. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, you name checked both Irene and Brenda in your introduction. So I think Irene got name checked first. So maybe I can send the same direction in your direction, please, um, Irene. Thank you, Gareth. 
Um, so similar to Don, I have a background in electrical and computer engineering as well. And I also have a background in engineering psychology. Uh, those were the two subjects that I studied in undergrad as an undergraduate student and as a graduate student. Uh, I began my career as an interaction designer at Netscape, uh, the world's first commercial web browser. And it immediately became apparent to me that I wanted my life's work to be in this whole area around how to make the internet accessible to the widest audience possible. And that informed my subsequent career choices where I then went to Yahoo, where I built Center Design Practice and ran design for Yahoo for eight years before moving on to Google in 2006 and built Google's human Center Design Practice and ran design for Google um, for six years. Um, and then uh, I was really interested in the potential of online education and the uh, possibility to democratize higher education, make that more accessible to people, create better and more paths towards um, a career in technology. And so that led me to Udacity when I joined them as a 20 person startup and ran design and product for a couple of years. Uh, I've been at Coastal Ventures as a design partner uh, since 2014, where I primarily advise uh, our CEOs in our portfolio to help them be successful, particularly with the power and strength of design. Um, regarding your question, like, why do I care about this? Um, what I found in uh, the mid 90s when I was in graduate school, originally studying electrical and computer engineering, was that I felt like my peers were all very interested in creating technology for the sake of technology. They were just in love with the technology uh, without giving a lot of thought to what they were building and why was it relevant. And I was especially interested in studying how can technology serve people uh, so that we elevate our own existence here in the world and make lives, make our own lives easier rather than having us serve the tech or having us be kind of slaves to the technology? Um, how can we design technology that works the way people work by studying people's behavioral patterns and motivations and um, all the human factors that go into how we process the world and interact with the world? Um, so the and, and it was actually during that time that I read one of Don's books, The Design of Everyday Things, um, which kind of set up light bulbs for me um, and inspired me to devote the rest of my uh, working life so far towards um, studying this area and then contributing however I can. Great. Thank you, Irene. And I think some of the themes that you've touched on there, I think particularly around purpose and intent, are themes we'll, we'll definitely come back to. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and uh, Brenda, over to you, please. Well, uh, my background is uh, originally in theater. Um, so I got my MFA in theater and my PhD in theater, although my dissertation topic was um, design of an interactive fantasy system, um, which turned out to be a pretty good sketch of virtual reality. And it's amazing that I talked my theater department into uh, letting me do that. Uh, I worked in computer games for many years um, as a designer and a, pro and a producer. Um, I became involved immediately in interaction design because I was in the game world. Um, I have always been a, uh, an activist around social justice and um, our connection with the natural world. So I think these are the most important things. Uh, my camera just turned off. So over to you, Gareth. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Well, for now we can still hear you, which is, which is great. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, Aaron, yourself, we'd love to hear from you, please. Yeah, um, well, I'll, I'll make it brief. Uh, I was born at a time uh, that sort of made me an optimist. Um, I was born in the 70s at the beginning of the, the technology kind of the shift. Um, I remember the first time I saw Mac, the first time I saw the internet, the first time I saw the web. And my only feelings for that, uh, all of those moments was positive. Like this is, uh, I'm, I'm headed into a very bright future. And that was sort of my temperament going into, um, you know, founding the, the UX team at MailChimp and the way that we designed um, a product experience for people to make, you know, that's aware of 
the emotions that they feel at the moment when they feel fear, uh, mistrust, et cetera. And we tried to experiment with the intersection of design and technology to address that. And I ended up writing a book about those experiments and many of the other experiments, very, very much inspired by Don's work that he did, um, you know, with uh, emotional design. And I have to admit that um, around 2011, I became a pessimist that what we were building with technology was actually uh, not great. You know, like it was taking us in a really negative direction. And um, I, I, I have been a pessimist for a while and now I'm kind of swinging back towards optimism. And, you know, during COVID, um, I ended up leaving the private sector and trying to do something about it, um, working with Dr. Tom Frieden, uh, who was President Obama's CDC director. Um, and we worked on um, COVID response in the U.S. using design and technology. We worked on COVID response um, in Africa with the Africa CDC and the WHO to try to create um, digital certificates for, for vaccine credentials. Um, and so I, I'm at this point where like, what can technology and design do um, that actually addresses what's going on in the world? And I think that's, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great conversation for us to be having. And I'm glad that a lot of people are here also interested in that topic. Great, thank you, Aaron. Um, and again, I think some of the themes you, you, you put out there in terms of just the sheer scale of connected people that the internet brings and just the increasing mm -hmm. kind of power and muscle of technology gives us opportunity for, for good or otherwise, and, and we'll certainly come back to that. Uh, so thank you, Aaron, and, and thank you to you all. Um, I wonder if I might start just where I suppose designers are used to starting, which is to explore the, the problem statement. Perhaps we can kind of found our discussion in a kind of agreed problem statement of, of the as-is state, if you'll indulge me, more design terminology. Um, Don, I wonder if I might direct this question at, at, at you. Um, when you. When you wrote your book, um, uh, how would you articulate the current problem within the world, which your book hypothesizes fix and, fixes and solutions to? What's, the, what's the, the core problem we're trying to solve? Like all things, there is no single core problem. Uh, we live in a complex system where everything is sort of interacted at the ecology, the, the actual physical environment, and the, uh, all of life forms of every sort, uh, animals, vegetables, uh, other other forms of life, uh, the atmosphere, um, the, and in the end, though, I think it's that people have over the years, over the many, many centuries, and thousands of years, have designed a world that is unsustainable. And it's in part is because the world appears to be completely infinite. And uh, so you take out the minerals, and uh, but there's a lot more. And you take out the water, and there's a lot more. And you, and you, you know, destroy the land, but there's a lot more. And um, we've also devised uh, sets of uh, arbitrary ways of living, arbitrary ways of behaving. The different cultures are different, but the notion of countries, for example, is relatively new in, in the life of humans, and is an artificial concept. The laws are all artificial. And laws are interesting because if you, if you want to know how people behave, just look at the laws. Uh, most of the laws are, are there because there's some behavior that, peop that people don't like. And so we pass a law against it. And if people do things that is that which liked, it's not in the laws. Uh, the Ten Commandments is a good example if you want to know how people used to behave. Um, and um, the, the real issue, though, is going to be human behavior. And that's what I started to focus on. And so I think that, for example, in, in, the, in the modern world, and it's mo modernism that is a part of the problem. And in the modern world, we sort of talked about the, either the Northern countries or the, the global North or sometimes the global West. And these are not geographical terms, by the way. Uh, the global North is basically Europe, or to be precise, Western Europe, uh, the United States, and, and most of the nowadays, the developed nations of the world. Australia is in the global north, for example. Um, and uh, the businesses there have a, have a bad economic model. Uh, it's not capitalism, because it's not the capitalism that was originally described by Adam Smith. It's, it's the modern capitalism where uh, profit it dominates over everything. And worse, short-term profit. 
And uh, so that if companies that want to do something good that may take a long time are penalized by the uh, stock market. And a few companies are able to overcome that, but it's difficult. We get short-term gains. So in many ways, the problems are the reward structures that we give in academia. You know, in academia, which is one of the culprits, academia specializes because you want to have the very best professors at your university. And so who can be the very best? Well, everybody can't be the very best unless you specialize in something so narrow, there's nobody else there. So of course you're the very best. And, but the specialties are very important. We, that's where we get a lot of tremendous knowledge. But if you want to do anything real in the world, you have to go, you have to be a generalist. You have to cut across all these areas to make advantage of the specialists. And guess what? If you're a generalist, you don't get promoted in the university. You may not even get hired in the first place. Uh, I like to say that if you do something that saves a thousand lives in the university, people will say, that's nice. But if you get a paper published in Nature or Science, you get promoted. And the same thing happens in industry. It's all about uh, immediate profits. So first of all, I, thought the, I think the economics that we follow is absolutely wrong. The economists think they understand people and they have no clue. Uh, they model people and they measure everything. They measure everything in dollars or euros, in money terms, in other words. And I think that's wrong. And so they make decisions based upon things that they measure, but you can't measure what they're measuring. They know they can't measure what they talk about. So what you do is you measure something that has some relationship to what you care about. And then you forget that what you're measuring is not what you care about because you named it by what you care about. So in this book, I say there are three major things. It's meaningful. So let's measure things that are meaningful. Let's not have a single number like intelligence or a gross domestic product that summarizes the really complex task. And what I, I, there's a, there are people who have solved this, who have done much better. I'm a fan of donut economics, a group of economists in Oxford who have a really nice way of saying, look, come on, it's a dashboard. Just like when you run a company, there's many, many factors, and you have to take a look on this dashboard and see how well we're doing in ecological variables. And because it's a donut, you have an outside and an inside. Let's take a look at the societal variables and see how well you're doing. So that's one of the things. Second, uh, the second word in the title is meaningful, sustainable, and then humanity-centered. Um, if you take one of the more popular books in design, the one that I wrote, Design of Everyday Things, and the methods that we propose, which we call human-centered design, it's all about being better for industry to sell more products to make more money. No thought about the impact this has upon the world, upon cultures, upon the economy, upon the ecological system. And so I've spent a lot of time worried about how do we make a sustainable world? We have to change. When we designers decide upon our designs, we should be very concerned about where the materials come from and where the power comes from. Even if doing digital designs is powered by electricity and moreover, no digital design can exist by itself. It has to exist on computers, physical devices. So where, do the, where does it come from? And you take a look at modern computers, they're designed to be so light and elegant, same with cell phones, they don't last very long and you can't repair them. It's really difficult to open them up. And so we, we destroy the environment when we mine for the materials, we destroy the environment when we manufacture it, we destroy the environment during usage, we destroy the environment when we throw them away since they have valuable components but we can't get them out. And so I'm a big fan of what's called the circular economy, which also comes from uh, Northern uh, Europe, from um, uh, the, um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is located on a little island in the south of England. And um, look, they're the champions in the circular economy, and we need to get our businesses to do that. A company like Patagonia, which makes clothing, follows the circular economy. Clothing, it turns out, and the word fashion means all clothing, uh, is the worst offender of creation of waste. Most of the clothes that are manufactured never get worn. They get thrown away without ever being worn. It's crazy. Okay, and then the last thing is humanity-centered. That is, when we go off to do societal things like the United Nations list of 17 uh, major SDGs, societal uh, development goals, 
Um, what the, the way we are doing it now, the way foundations of the world do it and the way the aid pro programs do it is we say, oh, there's a problem in sanitation here. And we send in the experts and the experts come in and they come back with a, a huge plan saying, here's what you need. It's going to take 10 or 20 years and many, many billions of dollars. And we do it. And guess what? It fails. They always fail because you don't, experts know about the issues, but they don't know about the people. And I'm saying, no, that's colonialism. When the English went into India and said, oh, you can't rule yourself, we'll rule for you. Isn't that nice of us? No, it isn't. And so we should stop doing that. The methods I taught in design, we send out the anthropologists to see what's going, what's wrong with you. No, the people living there know what's wrong with themselves. They're trying to fix it. They're really good people, but they don't have the resources. And if it's something like public health or, san or sanitation, they may not have the expertise. So the design community is the best community because you know design has no cut, no, no substance. Design is all about methods. And that's wonderful because that means that we can go in and find all the experts, all these specialists and use their knowledge to put it together. So we act as resources, as mentors, as facilitators, but not telling people what to do. The design comes from the people. So that's a long but very short summary of how I got to where I am and what I wrote in this book. Thank you, Don. And I wonder if I, uh, I invite Brenda in because Brenda, I know a lot of your interest and work is just about our relationship with others and with nature and with, res with resources. And, and Don picked up on a number of things in his, in his response there. Uh, are there any elements that you'd like to embellish or add to? Well, I do think um, there's an interaction design component in any uh, physical interventions with um, people's lives. So for example, solar panels. <laughs> when we try to create clean energy with solar panels, uh, some of the pushback we get is from people who think they're unattractive. There are people in Kansas right now passing laws in counties and cities to ban windmills and wind farms because people don't like looking at them out their windows. So what we have here is a failure to communicate. Right? And one of the things that designers can do is to help communications between industries or enterprises and the people they serve. So for example, um, with the installation of solar panels over aquifers, um, which started in India in 2015 and is now being prototyped in various places in California and the United States. Um, at first, the problem there was you know, what the hell is this for? How does this work? It, it, it's not useful to the people who live near the canal. And then what we learned was that we were able to reduce transmission delays um, by allowing people who live along canals immediate access to the power that those solar panels are generating. So there's a huge benefit that was buried underneath the climate story or the sustainable energy story needed to be foregrounded uh, to the people who are having difficulty with it. Uh, that's just one example. So I, I agree with Don, people know what they need. True. I think we have to be very careful with how we position ourselves when we try to offer assistance or support or expertise because uh, just from studying, for example, indigenous land rights issues as part of what I'm interested in. Um, you can give indigenous folks in a particular region a place at the table to have a conversation about land policy and land law, but they don't get to make the decision. They're not, they're not engaged in the policy production itself. So if you come in and say, Indigenous people, we're going to help you. Well, what that means is not we're going to have a chat with you. What that means is that we're going to help you fix the policy uh, that puts you outside the circle of decision making uh, in land land law disputes. So, I know I'm 
I'm trying to connect my interest in the natural world and indigenous rights uh, to the things that, that Don is interested in. And I think probably the most interesting part of Don's book for me is his emphasis on the local, on, on the fact that local people know what local problems are and local solutions are going to be more sustainable, more amenable to local culture. And, and there's also the side benefit of the strengthening of community. I would say when we talk about designing for a better world, one of the things we ought to be looking at is ways to strengthen community. We have generations of people here in the United States who've grown up in suburbs where the neighbors don't know each other with no sense of place, with no sense of belonging. And what ends up happening there when those natural human things are not present in our lives is that we find community in conspiracy theory groups on the internet. <laughs> we, we find community in radical political movements. That's not community. That's a, an aspect of identity. So the emphasis on local problem solving, local solutions, and, and studying how local people do those things has this extra benefit of bringing us back to a place where we are in small enough groups to actually care for each other in an active way. Um, and I just love that about your book, Don. I really appreciate that you're bringing that up. And that's that's a place where I really resonate with the work. Thank you. Can I interrupt for a second? Because I saw a chat statement. Someone said, I'm out. This is uh, too woke for me. Got nothing to do with design. And I want to make the statement to the audience that, look, one of the things we have to do to make a better world is change what we think design is all about. This is about design, it's about the fundamentals of the way design is approached and what we do. And it, it means though, a radical change in how we train designers and what designers are going to be doing. A change for the better, let me say. Thanks, Don. And one, one of the themes that we, we may, or may or may not get time to talk about in, on this session is just about um, how carefully we define what design is, because on the one hand, if we get it too narrow, we limit its influence. If we get it too broad, we we, we get a little bit more grandiose than perhaps um, uh, we, we, we should be. I would love to bring Aaron in at this stage because it, it strikes me, Aaron, um, both Dawn and Brenda have mentioned this community or local element as the, as the ideal grouping size to affect positive change. And I'm aware that in your work uh, at, at Resolve to Save Lives, you've got you know what the business people would call a big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, how do you deconstruct that into sort of meaningful um units that, that can affect uh, change in the work that you're involved in? Yeah, so the mission of Resolve to Save Lives is to save 100 million lives. And it focuses on two key areas. One is cardiovascular health, um, and the other is epidemic preparedness. And we've <laughs> very clear on the epidemic preparedness thing. We, we just went through a, a serious fire drill on that particular issue. Um, so it's it's drilling down on just the the top killers. Those are the two biggest killers in humanity um, right now. Um, now, how those are approached, that's where it gets it remains complex um, and complicated both. Um, so, you know, how those those are attacked, we look at it um, in different ways. Where can we move quickly? Um, what you know, what's an appropriate level of effort where we could make progress? Um, you know, it could be um, standing up new systems in uh, like Zimbabwe or um, supporting uh, technology, uh, like a, hiring a CTO for the um, Africa CDC or being involved with the WHO. So there's lots of different dimensions. And some of it is designing things like, you know, most of us would say, hey, we're going to jump into uh, Figma or Photoshop or write some code and make a thing um, as, uh, you know, Daniel Burke's team has done on the cardiovascular health side, um, or it could be on a policy side. So that's another thing, just to go back to, to Don's earlier point of like reimagining what design can and should be, is thinking about systems and how systems fit together. So it can be policies, it can be specific tools, and those things aren't really separated. They are all kind of integrated together. Um, so that's, that's an important thing that we should start thinking about. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and Irene, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts when, when you were um, introducing yourself. I think one of the things that you had mentioned was just how, even very early in your career, you observed how people were um, fell in love with the technology without kind of stopping to think about either its impact on humans or, or humans leading the how, how it was used. Um, what, what's what's your sense of the relationship between the, the the human side and the advanced in technology side as we as we think about how technology can can be used for for good? Um, I, as I asked the question, I'm, I'm struck by something I heard you share online about the the need for both um, analysis and empathy. We, we we need to discern or understand in, in more than one way. I'd love you just to explore a little bit around that, please. Yeah, I mean, I think the innovations that we create, whether it's technological or otherwise, whatever we put out in this world, it's reflection of who we are and what we value is important. Um, and so uh, we need to, I mean, my hope is that we choose to orient ourselves towards wholesome action as opposed to selfish actions. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's more nuanced and complex than that because the world is not black and white. Uh, we are holding everything in balance. And it's when things come out of balance that we experience suffering. Um, and I think one of the problems that uh, many, in, uh, many of people who are developing technology kind of face is that they rely too, um, uh, too singly on a, a single metric as success that has the potential to throw things out of balance. And that's where I think designers play a valuable and important role in helping the makers of technology to um, uh, consider and remember that we live in an ecosystem. It's multivariate. There are many lives at stake, not just human lives, but uh, animals, plants, bacteria. Um, and um, you know, we need to look at the whole ecosystem and how everything is interconnected in order to preserve a balance that's uh, oriented and optimized towards the well being of all living things on this planet. Um, I think one of the challenges in creating um, in, in innovative technologies is that, um, you know, we, everything comes with a duality. There's a good aspect and a downside to everything. There's a positive side and a downside to everything. And so then the question is like, what are we really optimizing for? And that's what design is ultimately about. Design is about having a point of view. And um, uh, you know, then, there, in, then we have the question of like, who's the arbiter of good? Um, whose perspective are we really optimizing for? And this is where things get really tricky. Um, you know, most investors that I know believe that they're investing in companies that will both make them money and do good in the world. Um, for instance, enterprise software to make us more efficient, fintech to empower people with perceived resources, or climate tech to address the greatest threats to humanity that we have now. Um, so there are many investors who are trying to deploy capital towards pro-social efforts. But uh, like Brenda said, like we need to act locally uh, we think globally, like what's going to benefit the world and the ecosystem that we live in. Um, but what can we do within our immediate communities and with what we can immediately affect uh, within our local environments to affect better change and what's best for the whole balance and the whole ecosystem that we reside in. Um, there, there is always going to be um, unintended consequences, a shadow to every innovation. Um, and, and I think to understand all the variables at play and all the stakeholders who have interests is paramount to us designing for a better world. Um, so uh, you know, Don mentioned how um, companies um, are oriented towards maximizing shareholder value. And so even if you have like the people within a company motivated and interested in designing for a better world and are able to make the right decisions, uh, ultimately, they are held accountable to the, the value of the stock price um, or what, you know, whether the shareholders are taking in more money. And so um, that opens up the question around, like, is, are the incentives that are motivating us is it really in the right place? Are there better metrics that we can use, um, even for the world beyond like GDP, for example, 
And how can we employ those so that we have better measures of success that orient us towards designing for a better world? Yeah, great. And, and, that, and that, that picks up just on, on uh, Dawn's, Dawn's earlier point, just around just me measuring the right stuff and, and the crudeness of some of the things that we use to determine you know, uh, how effective or otherwise some of our, some of our innovations are. Um, Brenda, I'll maybe uh, take this one over, over to you because I know we had a, an interesting uh, conversation earlier in the week when we thought about just how we manage as designers to get that balance right between the realization that a lot of the work that we do has been, has, has an intent that is capitalistic in nature and we all need that to buy things and pay mortgages and so on. But at the same time, with a, with a desire to, to do good, can can those two things sit sit in in, in happy tension? And is it, is it possible to pursue good intent without sounding moralistic or preachy or to quote one of our chat contributors, woke? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm too woke. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I what we talked about, Gareth, was this notion that um, we have grand strategic goals um, using military, you know, Sun Tzu talk here, but it, typically the way we think about objectives is we have this grand strategic goal, strategies in service of that grand strategy, and then tactics and logistics. So it looks like a tree structure. Now, if you look at a company that has maximizing shareholder value through sales as its grand strategic goal. It's going to have strategies that support that goal. Now I'm a designer working for that company. I used the example of Nike Town when we spoke about this earlier, that a person who was deeply involved with the design of Nike Town, a former student of mine from Art Center. Um, the company had the grand strategic goal for that activity, for that project as brand awareness. And, and showing off the brand in action. The designer wanted to serve that grand strategic goal, but he had his own ethical goal, which was to enhance interurban community, interurban community life for young people. So the strategy of creating a space where people could play and and be together that was safe in an urban environment, that strategy served both grand strategies. It served the company and it served the individual's ethical and moral interest in doing the right thing. That's a simple example, but I think we all have the opportunity to do that. And sometimes if you're trapped in a situation where you feel like your life and your design work are being run by the company's desire for profits. One thing you can do is say, well, right now, I'm just going to watch this as closely as possible. I'm going to learn my chops because when I get out of here, I'm going to kick some ass. I'm going to change some things, right? Um, that's how I spent, you know, 15 years in the computer game industry before I created a computer game company for little girls that wasn't Barbie. You know, because I did my time in the industry um, and I had investors who wanted us to make money. But I also had a, a, my own grand strategic goal, which was to help girls feel better about themselves and to celebrate their diversity. Um, now, it's, that's easier to do when you're running your own company. But my point is you can make these things work together. And if you're stuck as a junior designer in a place that you feel is not giving you your ethical voice, get involved with IXDA or other organizations. Develop that voice while learning the ropes of corporate life. Um, also, I must say, just to add quickly, um, Don was talking about generalists and the value of generalists. And this touches on the, on the same issue for me. I've had students in graduate programs come in with almost no understanding of history, civics, uh, philosophy, the humanities in general. These things are often woefully lacking in today's high school and university education systems. So if you aspire to be a good 
interaction designer, for heaven's sake, educate yourself in history, in the arts, in, in philosophy to the extent that you can. And if you're an educator in the world of design and your students are coming to you with lacks in these areas, try to build into your own curriculum in your own design program projects and, and assignments that feed their little heads around <laughs> around these topics that they may be missing. And I don't mean that young designers and design students have little heads. That was just a grandmaism. I apologize. That's quite okay. I'm going to stick with that theme of the relationship between um, capital and profit um, and what we might call higher intent or, or higher um, ideals. And I'll, I'll maybe aim this at yourself, Aaron. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that in the work that you do, again, with Resolve to Save Lives, you will doubtless come across partners who are motivated by philanthropy, and there will be other people you wish to work with um, who are motivated by profit. Um, do those different intents um, matter as long as you reach your desired outcomes? Um. I, I don't think that they're at odds. I think that there are times we choose to make them at odds, but it's it's really a choice. Um, and if I could just zoom out, I think that a lot of, you know, to, to go back to that original, what is the problem statement? I think one of our core problems is that we happen to be in kind of a, a, a nadir uh, generationally in um, uh, connectedness. You know, if when there's a large global problem like a world war, people unite and they design solutions together and they think beyond themselves and they um, it's easy to throw yourself into something bigger than you because you can feel it personally. But where we are, are right now is really in a, in a disconnected cycle where people are sort of like retreating to their populist views or to, you know, individual country motivations. And it, it's even like in our personal lives of like, I want to go live out away from everyone else and not feel connected to my community, my neighbors. And that, that personal connection that Brenda was talking about earlier is just like, it's such an important part um, of our motivational structure. Um, and, you know, we want in our careers, we want, you know, we want to make money and we want uh, status and so forth. And that's okay. Um, that's an important part of kind of like building this stable life that we want to have for our families and so forth, but also can sometimes take us apart. Um, and we see that in, you know, philanthropy. I've certainly, you know, been, been involved in philanthropic, um, you know, pitches to get, get people involved in, in bigger causes. And even when, you know, it's, it's a cause that's like clear and present, like epidemics, it's sometimes hard to get people involved in that because they're thinking about, you know, individual um, interests. Um, but I, I do think that there's a cycle that is shifting where, you know, there are some things on the horizon like climate change that will bring us together and help us see, like, there's a bigger opportunity to, to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Um, that's, I think that's off target from the question that you asked. So if, if, if you want to go in a different direction, let me know. No problem. But certainly I think, I think that need for that, that need for, connection and again if we can go back to that word empathy i think it's, it's something that's come through on a, on a number of different answers um we did we did promise our audience that we would make sure we had some space for their questions so i will take a slight um uh, segue or detour if i may folks and i'll maybe move on to some of the questions that the moderating team has sent through to me that have come through from from the folks who are here um i think there's been a number of questions related to uh, ai and so what I might do is I might um, direct the question to Dawn, but I would, I would love um, a broader set of answers. So I'll kick off with Dawn, but please do come in if you have some, some thoughts yourself. Um, in a few short months, the world has awakened to the power of, of AI, particularly generative um, AI. With tremendous power comes tremendous responsibility. How do we ensure AI benefits humanity as a whole? And can we avoid the inequitable distribution of the power it brings? Uh, that's a that's a big question for this time of the morning, Don. But I, I wonder, do you have any thoughts on it? Sure, I have many thoughts. Um, the but I want to just comment that um, I, I can't read the chat and listen to the to all of you at the same time. But I've been glancing at the chat, and there are some really very intelligent and valuable comments in that chat, suggestions and discussions. And 
I wonder if you can save the chat and distribute it or something because uh, I would love a chance to read it. Um, and some of the issues have to do with capitalism. And I want to point out, I think capitalism in principle is actually a really good way of honing in on, on improvements. But the way it's implemented is, is evil. And, but the implementation can be changed. Now, let's, because in, this is actually related to what people are talking about AI. AI is a weird field because, you know, <laughs> And the people who work in AI, and I, I have published in AI journals, I've been working in AI for, for 20, 30 years, in what is called good old fashioned AI. And even the modern ones, the modern neural networks were invented in my laboratory. Um, so uh, I understand what is going on today. Deep learning was uh, done by a former postdoctoral student of mine, uh, British. Uh, someone complained that all of us are Americans for seem to forget that this is actually coming from Ireland. But um, the uh, AI has been very powerful. And when AI works really well, then it, it, people say, oh yeah, that's a new technology, that's just a technology and it, we don't call it AI anymore. So as, when it becomes successful, the, the fact that my automobile is so much safer than automobiles of the past that, for example, when there's a crash and the airbags come in, you know, the airbag exposed like in a fraction, a, a millisecond or two after the crash. And it's a powerful AI that is able to do that, plus powerful sensors. When I take a picture with my cell phone, when the cell phones first started to have cameras, I said, well, the cell phone camera can never be very good because it has such a tiny, tiny receptor uh, the number of photons that he, he cell is looking like only one photon. How can you have a good picture? And I was correct in, by my physics, but I was wrong. The pictures that come out today are fantastic. It's AI that does the difference because actually instead of taking one picture, we take say 10 rapidly. That means it's as if you had 10 times the area, 10 times the size of the receptor. But combining them is, requires a lot of very powerful algorithms. And you notice that when you take a picture, there's a little rectangle in front of on everybody's faces that makes it makes the camera ideally focus on those things and et cetera. That's AI. There are lots of powers of AI. So yeah, suddenly the deep learning came out and the large language models came out. And what these are, they're simply pattern recognizers. They, they work on pattern match. They have no deep understanding whatsoever. And all the people who work in the field are fully aware of that. They don't have any intelligence. What they are doing is they simply putting together patterns from their long history. But you know what? It has been very useful. I have found it very valuable. Now, um, it's only been out, what, six months or something? Not very much. And so people are all excited and the hype is way up, way above what is necessary. I believe that eventually it will settle down and they will turn out to be a useful adjunct, which will make all of us do our jobs better. However, there are other ethical issues involved, like where did the data come from? And moreover, if they come from your sources, those are probably biased sources. And so hum human biases are now built into these fundamental machines. And that has to be, that has to be changed. But, but I'd like to say that the, the AI people that I know of and, and in every of the large companies are fully aware of the deficits. They weren't aware of them until, they, until it happened. They didn't predict this. They weren't aware, they, in theory they could have, but you know, hindsight is always much more powerful than foresight. So in hindsight, sure you could have predicted it, but at the time I wouldn't have predicted it. I would have thought, wow, this is getting more and better powerful. I neglected the power of biases. And so, I'm a fan of this because I think the generative tools already have existed in the design field for some time. Autodesk, the company, has been selling generative AI tools for designers that are wonderful and powerful. And they're not the large language models. They're not subject to those biases. So um, I'm, a, I'm a fan. I want to but add I'm that. A critic. But that's because the best way to make something better is to be a critic. That's how science works. When you ask a scientist, what you learn in science is to criticize every new thing that happens. You read a new paper, you will never come back and say, well, that's a wonderful paper. You train your students and say, well, there's a possible flaw here, or maybe this isn't right. 
but that's how science advances. So I'm going to be a critic of AI because I want it, I like it and I want it to get better. I, I just wanted to say that um, risk analysis is so important. Um, one of the things I used to teach all of my graduate students was when you do a scenario, be sure that that scenario has in it something going wrong, something breaking, and get as imaginative as you can about what that thing that breaks is, whether and, and show how one recovers from what goes wrong. Well, I don't think we did the best possible job of risk analysis with social media, but it's really difficult to do risk analysis on what's likely to be emergent rather than um, an obvious affordance. So a lot of what's gone wrong with uh, social media has been emergent behavior some of which we could have forecast through good risk analysis by talking to people, by emulating uh, the systems that we now have before we put them out. Um, and the same is true with AI, especially generative systems. And I agree, Don, you know, you love it. You love the potential of it. And that's why you have to be mindful and critical, uh, you know, of what, what can and does go wrong. Um, and what kinds of emergent behavior could occur uh, with these tools. So, you know, caution is, is the, name, the name of the game. Um, I, I'm not as optimistic as you are, Don, because I think right now people just screw things up um, because of the way our culture is currently situated. Um, the, uh, the temptation to spread false information, et cetera, is great. On the other hand, I think one of the greatest, most interesting challenges in AI right now that's, that is, is the ability to use a data set that is pre-existing in some specialized area like medicine or chemistry um, to, to train uh, a system. Uh, we, we know this is working in, in, for example, the invention of certain kinds of drugs uh, that, that couldn't have happened otherwise um, through the use of artificial intelligence. And now this great challenge comes where, let's say I'm trying to solve a problem that involves uh, geology and agriculture. So I have two completely different database uh, formats and sources. How do I get these things? <laughs> how do I create correlation and causality statements about these two uh, disparate databases? I think that's right in front of us. I think that's ahead of us. And I think it's a really promising um, move in, in, in the AI world. Thank you, Brenda. I wonder if I give Irene the, the last word on this one, because I'm very aware, Irene, that you are in, in the venture world. Uh, and obviously, we I think the venture world sees the potential um, of, of AI. What, what's it like marrying up the, the commercial opportunity with the need to keep one eye on a better world? Yeah, I happen to work at a firm that is on the forefront of investing in AI. I mean, we've been investing in AI long before many people have looked at it. We were the first and only investor to invest in open AI. Um, I mean, whether whether we want it, whether we are optimistic or pessimistic about AI, it is happening and it's happening faster than we realize. And if we regulate it or slow it down deliberately, the development of AI technology, um, then competitors um, have an advantage. And we're not just talking about other companies, but even on the world stage. So, um, you know, at, at that level, it's almost like a national security issue. Um, yes. AI, just like any kind of technology that is developed, can be used for good intentions or bad intentions. Um, what we need to look at is how are we training it? How are we using it? Um, it might be helpful to kind of look back at, I, I mean, anytime I feel a lot of anxiety and concern about uh, AI and, and its uh, potential impact on the world, I think back to like um, my daily life and how I benefit from dishwashers and washing machines. 
Um, <laughs> like lots of jobs were lost because, you know, we no longer have people who, uh, we don't have like a lot of people in the household, like uh, servants to do our laundry or wash our dishes. You know, this is all kind of left now on the homeowner. Lots of jobs were lost, um, but also lots of time has been gained that allows people especially women to do other things. I mean, this is really a big reason why women were able to explore other opportunities, get more financially independent, have their own careers um, because of technology, right? Um, another example, my ex-husband's uncle used to paint and draw graphics for the evening news. Um, he was eventually displaced because of computer graphic design. Is that good or is that bad? Is the advent of Photoshop good or bad? Um, it almost doesn't matter because either way, Photoshop could not be stopped. No amount of scenario planning or planning, looking at risks and things like that would have changed the outcome. And those of you who you know make a living off of being a graphic designer, you know, uh, is, is it good or bad <laughs> that Photoshop was created? Um, so it's really hard for us from where we're sitting now to make a judgment call about this. But um, we know that AI is going to be a reflection of the people who make it. And so it's really important that everyone who's involved in the create in, in the creation and employment of AI to be very mindful and deliberate and intentional about what is training the AI and how and where and why is it used. Uh, job loss as a result of AI is inevitable. Uh, it's also not necessarily a bad thing in that it will also create a lot of opportunities. It will shift how we spend our time and that transition will be incredibly hard incredibly difficult. It means that at the government and at the policy level, we need to prepare for this future through social safety nets like universal basic income, universal health care, things like that. Uh, maybe that sounds woke, but this is the future. This is the reality that we're facing. Um, I also want to address a point that um, was going on in the chat. My buddy Peter Morholtz made a comment about how design is a handmaiden of capitalism. And um, I, I, I mean, yeah. forgive me, if you could just keep your comments yeah. to one minute. I'm conscious of time, but please do comment. Yeah. Uh, you know, design is a handmaiden of capitalism historically because that's what we as a society and a country have uh, valued. That's what's driven our economy. If you go to a place like Denmark, they believe design is a human right. It permeates everything they do from food to public housing. Everybody benefits from great design. Places like Denmark, Japan, they value design and they believe in the potential power of intentional design. And that's why they invent, invest in it at the government and at the societal level. It's not just a tool that's left in the hands of companies to use design to make money. So I just want everybody to take away with these parting thoughts. Design is not just to help people make money. Design is not just to help people live in more beautiful spaces. Design has the power to affect how we think and behave and feel. It's an enabler and it's an opportunity to steer behavior. Just like the design of the built environment makes it easier for people to do the right thing or live in less healthy ways. So we collectively can choose where and when and how to be deliberate and intentional with anything we make, not just tech, not just things that are sold, but in everything we touch. And that's, just not, that's not just limited to a US worldview, that's across the world. Thank Mic you, drop. <laughs> <laughs> I think if this was an evangelical meeting, we would be we would have our hearts in the air. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Um, I wonder, could I invite our other three panelists, please? If I could, if I could limit you to one sentence each, is there one final piece of advice or comment you'd like to leave our audience with this evening? Um, uh, Aaron, I'll maybe ask you to kick us off, please. Um, one final sentence. There are opportunities to do good, to use design to feed your family and be part of something bigger in the world. There are lots of opportunities out there. Thank you. Brenda? Never lose heart. Thank you. And, and Dawn, we'll finish with yourself. Design should be playing a more important role in society and especially in companies. And the only way this will happen is if designers become more broadly educated so they can move up in the roles. There are very few chief design officers in large companies. And that's because they, to be a large officer, 
you must actually have a broader point of view. You can no longer be focused only on your own discipline. So broaden your education, think as a system across the world. Thank you. Uh, to Brenda, to Aaron, to Aaron, Aaron, and to Don, thank you so much for so generously giving your, your time and thoughts and energy. I will pass back to my colleague, Lisa, who's just going to wrap things up for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of our panelists. What an insightful and meaningful conversation this has been. Um, for everybody who joined us, thank you so much for spending your time with us, morning, afternoon, or evening. Um, I'm just going to remind you that this was brought to you by the UX Design Institute. You will see our website on the screen again right now for anyone who wants to peruse our website. The link should be in the chat as well. And to remind you, there is a 30% discount on our early bird pricing right now. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you again so much, panelists and audience. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye.